Are you ready for your encounter with the destiny? Are you ready for that day which is to come where your destiny will be revealed? If you turn with me please to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 2 Corinthians chapter 5 let's see what Paul says here to the Corinthian church as you know the 2 Corinthians was a letter written after they had realized there were certain things wrong he wrote to them a very corrective letter and then in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 9 uh, it says therefore we make it our aim whether present or absent to be well pleasing to him do we make it our aim to be well pleasing to God Reverend being well pleasing to God is more than just obeying his commands being well pleasing to God is doing the things that are pleasing in his sight it's far over and beyond keeping his commandments that's the bare minimum and let's continue reading then he reads for we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ we all good and bad have to appear before Christ's judgment seat we all have to stand in judgment but you know brethren that standing in judgment it's only temporary because after the judgment it remains one question whether you and I will still stand with him you know quite often we read um a warning to us in Luke 21 verse 36 if you turn there please with me and quite often we only look at it from a temporary escaping of the things to come because it says in Luke 21 verse 36 watch therefore and as I've mentioned before, you may recall, you need to read from verse 34 because it's telling us what to, telling us what to take heed, what to watch. So in verse 34 tells us what to watch. And therefore, in verse 36 says, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape. Now, quite often we only look at that to say, oh well, to escape the tribulation. But what about, remember I mentioned previously, you peel the layers of an onion and you get a deeper meaning. What about escaping the lake of fire? You know, we got to look deeper. And it says, what if it to escape all these things so it's this but there's deeper meaning in it because it says that they'll come to pass and to stand before the son of man do you know that word stand is not the same word as standing before the judgment seat in Romans 14 10 talks about you standing before the judgment seat which means you appear but yeah stand it says yeah to stand before the son of man that word which is Greek 2476 in the concordance which is histamai that means to keep his place so when you stand before the Son of Man, that means you keep your place there with Him. That means as a bride, you stand with Him and well, forever, and you stand well into the millennium and eternity. You stand with Him. 
to stand firm, to keep your place. So, you know, we need to watch. So not only to escape the terrible things, but we need to look at it beyond that. We need to watch and be counted worthy to escape the ultimate end of all these things, which is the final judgment and to stand before Christ with him forever and eternity. What a lovely meaning it's in there when we start looking at things with a deeper spiritual intent. Brethren, if you and I will stand before Christ and with him for eternity, that means you and I will be part of the first fruits. We will be part of the first resurrection, or if we're still alive, of those that will be changed during his coming. Which means you and I will witness and be part of the greatest event to occur to mankind, which is Christ's coming to establish his kingdom on earth to rule on earth the government of God the kingdom of God ruling on earth and as we heard in the sermon this morning and uh, also in the sermonette early on the meaning of trumpets is that separating evil from good it's that we need to be prepared for that evil when it will be finally destroyed and the major event of that obviously is the return of Christ which the nation as we heard in the sermonette is just you know going wrong and so trumpets has let's call it the pinnacle the ultimate meaning the apis the, the very top of its meaning is the return of Jesus Christ but today I want to look at the day of trumpets because it is in plural not just the last trumpet but trumpets and I want to look at a wider meaning of the day of trumpets not only and obviously including the return of Christ but also the events that are building up to the return of Christ and will uh, the return of Christ will trigger from the first trumpet till just before Satan is put away so there's a whole set of events that will happen there. And why do I want to go through this? Now obviously, for us to understand some of the scriptures that maybe we have not looked at for a number of years, or we have not understood, but really is to motivate us to be ready. To make, motivate us to be ready. Brethren, we have to be ready like the bride will be ready. So it's really to just give us an additional motivation and at the same time to give us hope. You know, brethren, as we're going to see, there's going to be terrible things. But throughout it, I'll show you all along there's hope. There's hope. God will protect his people. God will protect his people. I always give the analogy that a father and a mother, when they correct the children, they don't correct at the same time the obedient and the disobedient. The correction is to the disobedient. The obedience don't need the correction. And likewise, God is more righteous than what we are. He's not going to punish the obedient children those that are doing the things that are pleasing in his sight and so that motivates us and gives us hope because God is love 
Jesus Christ is love. His whole law is love and care and concern for us. So he's not going to do anything which is against that. And so, we do have the good news. The good news that yes, we'll be protected, but the good news is that beyond that bad time, an even better time is going to come. There's going to come a millennium in which the kingdom of God will reign on earth for initially a thousand years. And beyond that, even more, there's great hope. And so this festival of trumpets represents a number of things that will happen from the first trumpet to the last trumpet and around those times. So it will be a period of time. In other words, it's the beginning what will bring about the kingdom of God to come to earth so that the kingdom of God will reign on earth initially for a thousand years but that kingdom of God will reign on earth so that God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven and that is good news that is good news for everybody and for every person in this world you know, you and I know the Lord's Prayer. And if you turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. And there we, we know very well, Our Father art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Obviously, we don't pray that way, brethren. It's just a model, a guideline for us to expand more prayer along those themes but in Matthew 6 verse 10 brings a point here which says your kingdom come brethren it means that it's not yet today yet otherwise why would we pray thy kingdom come it's not yet yet so we're praying for that time of God's kingdom to come we're actually praying for the ultimate fulfillment of that seventh trumpet when Christ's kingdom will come to earth and will reign on earth. But then it says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Brethren, God's will is not being done on earth today. We heard so clearly in the sermonette how God's will is not being done in our nation today. And we, we groan and we sorry and, and we, we cry and sigh and moan for God's kingdom to come because of the sins of, of, of our nations. Are you going to be part of the kingdom of God when it comes to earth? Are you going to be part of those first fruits? Or not? Obviously you and I can. You've been called for it. But are we changing and are we readying ourselves for it? You see, the kingdom of God is going to be a ruling family. A ruling family. Now think about it. Think about the British family, British royal family. That is the royal family. It's a family. It's a royal family. We're going to be part of that royal family of God. The last name, the surname, will be God. You will have that name written on you as part of that family. The question is, Will you and I be in that family ruling the people that are on earth or not? And brethren, for you to rule, you have to be trained. You can't rule if you're not trained. And so we go through a training process today. But as we read here in verse 10, your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Well, that means it's done in heaven now, but it's not done here. What is God's will? What is God's will? What does God want of us? In very simple terms. What is God's will? Turn with me to Deuteronomy 30, verse 15 to 20. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15 to 20. And Yah describes very clearly what God's will is. But he gives us a choice. You see, it's his will, but it's not his enforcing it upon us. He gives us a choice. So in Deuteronomy 30, verse 15 says, See, I've set before you life and good, death and evil. You see, I've set before you two trees. A tree of life and a tree of death. That's what he's giving us a choice. In verse 16. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God and to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments that you may live. That's the tree of life that you may live and multiply. In other words, have a lot of children and be happy. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. So that's one option that you and I have. There's the other option. It says, but if he, your heart turns away so that you will not hear, and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. I think the word surely is pretty definite. I think it's pretty definite. It's not might. It's not probably, it's not possibly, it surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you uh, cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. Verse 19, I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I have set before you life and death. Two trees, a tree of life and a tree of death. A tree of blessing and, or a tree of cursing. Therefore, what is God's will? What is God's will? He says, choose life. That is God's will for you and I, to choose life. That both you and your descendants may live. That you may love the Lord, the eternal your God, that you may obey His voice, uh, and that you may cling to Him, for He is your life. And the length of your days, that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. So what is God's will? Life, blessings, everything that is good. And that's what he wants to give mankind and everyone. And he will do that when he rules on earth. But what do we have today? We've got suffering, pain. Suffering, we see people suffering that it's so terrible. We see things on TV and people suffering that it's so terrible. It's so sad. Why? Why? Because people have chosen the wrong way. Why? Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 through 5. Well, this is describing the society we live in today. And he says, but this know that in the last days, that's the times that we live now, perilous times will come. Perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. People are just selfish. Me, myself, and I, lovers of money, in other words, what affects their back pocket, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. 
Brethren, that's the society we live in. That's why we have problems. That's why we have suffering today. Because the carnal mind is against God. It's enmity against God. It's inclined to sin. And look in verse 5. Having a form of godliness. In other words, the carnal mind, they go to church... They are very sweet and loving, going to church, very sweet. They have a form, an outward appearance of being very religious, but denying its power. What is the power of true religion? It's God's Holy Spirit to change us so that we may become more like Christ. It's putting on Christ to become more like Christ. They are denying. They are not becoming more like Christ. Now. Can you and I. Fix that problem? Can you and I. Fix the people out in the world? No we cannot. I cannot fix. Anybody else's mind. I can only fix one mind. I only receive God's power to do to fix one mind and one heart and that's mine that's all I can do I've got no power to change others God's Holy Spirit is all powerful but he only gives us his Holy Spirit the power of his spirit for one specific area that's to change ourselves and yes, he's given everything you and I need to change ourselves. You and I cannot fix, cannot fix the course of this world, of the society. And don't you think you can? Because the moment you think you can, you're putting yourself in God's position. You cannot. So don't battle in vain. Because you can't fix it. And if you are trying to get involved into politics. With this party or that party or this person or that person. Because he's going to fix our problems. You are wrong. Do not get involved in the politics of this world. And particularly in this country. We talk a lot about politics we talk a lot about politics and it's easy for us to get wrapped into it now, I'm not saying put your head in the sand like a proverbial ostrich but what I'm saying is don't get involved because it's not going to solve anything the only ruler the only king that is going to solve the problems. The only president, quote unquote, that is going to solve the problems is Jesus Christ. And that's the government that you and I need to back. For instance, the ambassador of France in the United States does not get involved with American politics. And likewise, the U.S. ambassador in Japan cannot get involved with Japanese internal politics. Because the ambassador represents another country. And you and I are ambassadors of the kingdom of God. We are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And therefore, as ambassadors, we can't get involved with the internal politics of a different nation. This is not the kingdom of God. Whatever nation you may be talking about, whether it's Portugal or Brazil or whatever it is, I can talk to any of those nations with the same thing. So don't get involved in the politics of this world because it's only God's supernatural intervention in the world will solve the problems of this world. Only God's supernatural intervention in this world 
will solve the problems of this world. And when is he going to get involved? When he gets involved, he'll make it loud and clear that he's getting involved. He's not going to do it in secret. He'll make it really loud and clear that everybody will understand. Let me show you how loud and clear you'll make it in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12 to 17. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12 to 17. This is when he makes it clear that he's getting involved to solve the world's problems. Revelation 6, starting from verse 12. I looked when he opened the fifth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. Oh, blood moons! No, 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 I mean the sun. It's a lot more, and this is after the tribulation. And he says, And the stars of heaven fell to the earth. Wow, this is big stuff. As a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken off by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll. Wow, can you think of a sky receding like a scroll? This is big stuff. It's not just a, a lunar eclipse. This is big stuff. And every mountain and island was moved out of its place. What? What? Every mountain and island will move out of its place. And the kings of the earth, that means the president of the United States, the president of Germany, the president of Japan, the president of China, the kings of the earth, the great men, the wealthy men, the Bill Gates and others, the great men, the rich, the commanders, the mighty men, Every slave and every free man hide or hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. This will be big event. This will be a major event. So when God shows himself that he's going to start intervening in the world's affairs, it's not going to be just a little tiny lunar eclipse. Big stuff. And you know what? When is that lunar eclipse? In a couple of days' time. You probably won't even notice it. You probably won't even notice it. So, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. It's the wrath of God. The wrath of Jesus Christ. He is now angry and he says, Okay, that is enough. For the great day of his wrath has come. And he was able to stand. And so that's God's sign. There's going to be major disturbance in the heavens that he's going to intervene. But before he intervenes, because you see him intervening in chapter 8, and there he says, It's the, se the seventh seal. And there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Aha! So God is intervening, and He has the trumpets. The meaning of these days, symbolic of the trumpets, which we normally focus on the last one, which is the, the most important and a crucial one for us, but affects all of them. But something happens before that between the end of chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 8 and that is his servants are sealed look at it verse 3 for instance do not arm the earth and the sea and the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads so during the tribulation there will be a lot of people that will repent and people in the world that we are preaching to today and today it just goes right over the head but once times get tough and these things go wrong 
then their eyes will be open and a lot will repent. Plus, there will be the work of the two witnesses in parallel, and so those people will repent. And when they repent, from Israel there's 144,000, from all the other nations there's a great multitude of people. They will repent, and they will be sealed, and they will pr be protected from these terrible things to come. So, the good news, yeah, brethren, is that God is not going to punish those people who have repented when he intervenes on world affairs, which is his wrath, to punish the world, those people who have repented will be protected. And I'm not even talking about part of the church, which may be protected before that. You know, I'm talking about the, a great amount of people, a great multitude of people, even 144,000 from the 12 tribes, but a great multitude of people from all, all nations, they will repent, and God will protect them during this period of trumpets. They will be protected. And so, starting in chapter 8, we talk about the trumpets, which is when God starts intervening. Now, I want to look at a prophecy in Zephaniah, about this day. So keep your fingers there on Revelation 8 because we're going to come back to it. But make uh, let's go to Zephaniah. Now where is Zephaniah? Let me look at the beginning of the Bible. Well, it's Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. So it's kind of, it's the fourth book before Matthew. So right at the end there. So if we go to Matthew and then just go a few pages back, then you got Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, and then Matthew. So Zephaniah, and we're going to read a little bit in chapter 1. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. Now we've seen the great day of the Lord. It's after that, uh, the heavenly sign says, the great day of the Lord is here, his wrath. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. So it's God's day. It's the day of the Lord. Yeah, it's, it's this time period, probably over a period of a year, um, that is, 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 is bitter. It says the day of the Lord is, is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out. That day is a day of wrath. Yes, it's God's wrath. A day of trouble and distress. A day of devastation and desolation. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. It was these people that think, aha, we are so important those 45 cities and God is intervening and it's a war from God to these people verse 17 I'll bring distress upon men and they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against God they have sinned against the eternal their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like refuse you see this day is going to begin. And so it's saying, it's going to be a terrible day. Because the people have repented, they'll repent. Now these are unrepentant people in the world. But look at chapter 2. Look at chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather. O undesirable nation. Gather yourselves together, O undesirable nation. Who is the undesirable nation? Oh, well, you could look at it physically and say it's Israel. But if you peel the onion and says, okay, let me look at the spiritual, who is the spiritual undesirable nation? At that time, it will be the church of God. Because it will be persecuted by Satan. Because... God's people will not want to have the mark of the beast 
and they will be the undesirable nation. So gather yourselves together, yes, gather, O oh, undesirable nation. Huh? Is the Church of God today not gathered together? Makes you think, doesn't it? Particularly those of you that have been around for a while, that's a very significant statement here. And it says, before the decree is issued, or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you. So before that day, gather yourselves together, Church of God. Before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Verse 3. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth. That's not the Israelites, the Jewish people. That's God's people. That's God's church, the meek of the earth. Who have upheld his justice. They have kept God's commandments. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. Huh, maybe some of us have not been too humble. It may be that you will be hidden. Wow. It may be that you may be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. So brethren, he has a warning to God's church as I read it. And it's saying, before that great and terrible day, we've got to be humble, we've got to be meek, we've got to seek justice before that fierce day comes. So now, let's look at that fierce day going to Revelation chapter 8. And that Revelation chapter 8, it's got the breakdown of those seven trumpets. And very briefly, the first one is from uh, verse 7. And, and it says, the first angel sounded, that's the first trumpet, which basically is affecting vegetation on earth, all green grass, and the trees, a third of that is destroyed, is burnt. Hail and fire mingled with blood on the earth, affecting the vegetation on earth. The second one is in verse 8 and 9, which is basically upon salt waters. Yeah, the sea, salt waters. Not uh, um, fresh water, but salt waters. Salt water from the sea. And it says there, and was thrown unto the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of living creatures, creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Now God is angry. And this is God's punishment into the world. And then we get to the third angel. And now is to fresh waters. Now it's fresh waters because it says a third of the rivers and the springs of water. So that's fresh water. And so it says there and and the name of the star is wormwood, verse 11. A third of the waters, that's fresh water, became wormwood, that's bitter. And many men died from the water because it was made bitter. So we see a lot of people die. God is very angry and is, uh, is punishing the world. And then we get to the fourth angel, the fourth trumpet, verse 12, which is basically says a third of the sun and a third of the moon and a third of the stars We're darkened. So you can see it's like a second wave of heavenly signs. It's a second wave of heavenly signs. God is punishing. And these first four, which are the first punishments on the earth during the seven trumpets, uh, it's the beginning of the punishment. Then the last three are coming, and it says there at the end of verse 13, Whoa, whoa, whoa to the inhabitants of the earth because the three lost angels are about to sound that is the fifth, the sixth and the seventh trumpet so those are about to sound and then in chapter 9 it talks about the, the fifth angel that's the fifth trumpet and then you can see there that it's talking about locusts come upon the earth in verse 3 and uh, they were given power as the scorpions. Here it was they bite and sting and hurt. And it says, and it, 
they commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree so it's got some sort of uh, I would call it biological or chemical type of warfare um, and whether it will be that or not I do not know but something like that uh, but it, because it only affect people and it only will affect people that have not been protected by God you see that's what it says will affect uh, do not harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree but only those men who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads so only those that were not sealed in Revelation 7 so the ones that were sealed in Revelation 7 will not be affected you see there is the hope that people that repent maybe some of our relatives that are not in the church when those things bad happen during the tribulation they will repent and they will be protected. There's hope for them. So our job today is to be a good example, to be encouraging, to leave them something that one day when these things happen, they'll look back and it says, aha, George or so-and-so or so-and-so was right, and therefore we better repent. And then they will repent and they'll be protected. They'll be sealed. And it says, and, and this punishment it says uh, in verse 5 and they were not given authority to kill them ah, so those people were not killed but they were tormented for five months so now we have a period of five months so you know this day of trumpets is longer than a day it's longer than a day at least five months here yeah. so there's this period which is a considerable amount of time we think it's probably as long as a year but for five months, those people that are attacked by this military machine, uh, which is these locusts, uh, they will be attacking a certain other group uh, uh, in, on earth. One speculation is that it might be the beast power attacking the nations of the north and east. So... Uh, so then uh, um, we continue and then in verse 12 says that's the end of the world and then in verse 13 it's the sixth angel which is the next woe and there you read this says so the four angels says release this the, the angels from the Ilth, river Euphrates so the four angels in verse 15 says we had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year they were released to kill a third of mankind. Brethren, this will be, as you can see in verse 16, an army of 200 million people. Now clearly, 200 million people, it's practically, not quite, but the United States got 300 million people in total, including man, woman and child. So it's really an army nearly the size of the whole population of the United States. A huge army. So it must come from a huge nation. Pe nations that have a lot of people that you could have just men of arms to make up that number. And so I believe that will be the nations of the North and East, maybe like China, Russia, India, Iran, Japan, those nations united, counterattacking now against the beast power and for them to kill a third of mankind they will use the atomic bombs that we are helping them to protect them or whatever you know they'll have plenty of atomic bombs and they can cause devastation in the world terrible devastation you see uh, at the end of verse 17 it says uh, they were like uh, and out of their mouths can fire smoke and brimstone so it's, it's a type of destruction with burning and things like that, typical of something like a nuclear or an atomic bomb. I'm not saying it's that, but it is pretty devastating. It just gives an idea of what it could be. Um, and the point here in verse 20 says, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent. 
did not. Look at verse 21. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries and their sexual immorality or their thefts. Reverend, he asked people that went through the tribulation, they did not repent through that, and now they are completely unrepentant. And even when God punishes them because they are, quote-unquote, the naughty children, and they still don't repent. They're still rebellious. And so it's going to be a, a very tough period. A very tough period. Look at what God says in Zephaniah. So let's go back to Zephaniah. I should have asked you to keep a marker there on Zephaniah. But we're going to come back to Revelation. So if we go back to Zephaniah. So again, it's just before the end of the Old Testament. So we've got Zeph Zephaniah. Haggai. Zechariah Malachi. So Zephaniah chapter 3. Now let's look at Zephaniah chapter 3. And we're going to read in verse 8. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 8. Therefore, wait for me, says the Lord. Wait for me, says the Lord. Who is me? It's Jesus Christ, the second coming. And wait for me, says the Lord. Until the day I rise up for plunder. It was till the day that Jesus Christ returns and rises up. Just wait. Remember, you'll be protected. You'll be protected. Just wait till the end. You see, there's an encouragement here. I mean, even though these things are terrible happening in the world, brethren, you can be protected and your loved ones can be protected if they repent during the tribulation. There's hope for them too. And we need to pray for them that they will repent because there's hope for them. And it says, wait for me until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations. What God is trying to do, he says, I want to bring the nations all together so that when they together, I can fight them all in one place. And you know what it says. They will be gathered together in the valley of, of Armageddon. And then Christ will fight them all there. That's what his purpose is. That's what his determination. So he has this attack and then counterattack. And what do you think they're going to do next? They're going to say, well, you are trying to kill me. I'm trying to kill you. And now it's going to be either you or me or none of us. And they're going to try and kill each other and destroy the world. And so what God's doing is bringing them together into one place. And then God will zap them zap them quickly all in one place my determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms to pour on them my indignation all my fierce anger all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy obviously it's not every human being but all those people that are those warring nations that will be gathered together <coughs> for then for then look at verse 9 I will restore to the peoples a pure language. You see, once the world tomorrow comes, God is going to restore to us a pure language. That they may call on the Lord and the name of the Lord to serve Him with one accord. People will be able to have a clean Bible, a pure Bible, with one pure language all the mistranslations sorted out and a pure clean language that we all understand it clearly and so that they all may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord For from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia my worshippers, the daughter of my dispersed ones shall bring my offering in that day you shall not be shamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me. For then I'll take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride. And you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people. You know the people be punished. 
people be punished. But the ones that will be left into the world tomorrow will be people that will be teachable, meek and humble. Teachable and humble. And they shall trust in the name of the Lord. So when are we going to come into the world tomorrow and as teachers, the mankind will have been, let's call it, softened. Will become meek and teachable. And the ones that do not repent, they will be punished in a way that, uh, as, as the scripture says. So the remnant, the remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies. Nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in your mouth. For they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cut out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. Jesus Christ, the King of Israel, will be in our midst reigning on earth. You shall see disaster no more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear Zion, let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One will save. That's Jesus Christ will be amongst us on earth. And He'll say, He will rejoice over you with gladness. He'll, he'll quiet you with His love. He'll rejoice over you with singing. I'll gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly who are among you, to him its reproach is a burden. Behold, at that time, I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather those who were driven out. I'll appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they were put to shame. At that time, I'll bring you back. Even at that time, I'll gather you. For I'll give you fame and praise. Among all, among all the peoples of the earth, when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. Brethren, there's a great hope. And that's why in verse 8 said, Therefore wait for me. Wait for me. There's a hope. He's going to intervene and he's going to bring peace on earth. But the rebels will be punished. And so, when we looked there at Revelation 8 and 9, we saw punishment. And now, go back to Revelation, please. And let's look at Revelation 10. Revelation 10. And we're going to read verse 6 and 7. In fact, uh, with a sentence of verse 5, 5 through 7. Then Angel I saw standing on the sea and on the land, raised up his hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. You see, when these things happen, there's no further delay. There's been this attack, the counterattack, no further delay. Verse 7. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, that's the seventh, the last trumpet, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. What is the mystery of God that is going to be revealed? What is the mystery of God that is going to be revealed at the seventh trumpet? At the last trump, you know, the dead in Christ will be raised and we in Christ that are alive will be changed. That is the mystery of God that will be revealed. What is that? It's the revealing of the sons of God. And daughters, of course. And it says, At that time of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Make a note of Romans 8 verse 19. Do you know what Romans 8 verse 19 says? It says, The earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. 
The whole creation waits for the revealing of the sons of God. When is that? At the last trump. The whole creation is waiting. Mr. Myers had in this past uh, uh, past weekend Beyond Today program about three mind-boggling events. I think that was the title. And if you haven't watched it, please watch it. It's really outstanding. But the third mind-boggling event, he calls it not just a little bit of God. I thought that was an interesting way to put it. In other words, when you and I will be changed to spirit beings, we'll not just be just a little bit of God. We'll be in the full glory of a God being, of course, lower than the Father, lower than Christ. You know, in that authority, a lot, but in that full glory and beauty and power. Brethren, I don't think you and I can imagine that. And as it says, the whole creation eagerly waits. Now, who's the creation that is waiting? Is it the trees? Oh, well, you could say it's the trees if you look at it from a physical point of view, because the trees and things, the creation will be restored, earth will be restored, and it will be beautiful, and, and the pollution will be gone. And Sure, you can look at it from a physical point of view. But again, peel the layer of onion and look at the spiritual. Who is all in the creation that is waiting? Do you know who it is? the angels they're waiting to see when the sons of God will be revealed they will be amazed now your human mind and my human mind we just cannot comprehend the beauty of what that will be we just cannot comprehend there's a great hope at that seventh trumpet a great hope But brethren, when Christ comes at that seventh trumpet, what do we see? Look at Revelation 11, verse 15. Revelation 11, verse 15. It says, The seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world... Here was the governments of this world, American government, Chinese government, Japanese government, Portuguese government, Brazilian government, Italian government, German government, and you can go on and on and on. There's many governments. So all the governments of this world have become the governments of God. In other words, the kingdom of God. They will build God's kingdom will take over all human governments. No more. No more elections, no more uh, Elections in Brazil, no more elections in Portugal, no more elections in China, if they have elections there, which I don't think they do, but uh, whatever, <laughs> no more. The kingdom of God will take over all nations and will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And look at it a bit later, and he says, and the 24 elders who sat before God in his thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God saying we give you thanks O Lord God Almighty the one who is and was and who is to come because you have taken your great power and have reigned and the nations were angry and your wrath has come and so the nations are angry Christ is coming there's the nations been gathered in the valley of Armageddon they now see, quote-unquote, an invader from outer space, an alien. Let's fight those aliens. And we know they're fighting Christ himself. And it says, and the nations are angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead they should be judged. Point number one. Time of the dead they should be judged. What does that mean? That means the first resurrection. You see, because if some are resurrected and some are not, 
Isn't that a judgment? That is a judgment of the ones that are dead. The ones that are dead are judged, some to be resurrected in the first resurrection, and some to wait for the second. That is a judgment of the dead. The time of the judgment of the dead. Two, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets. So, to be in the first resurrection is to receive, receive eternal life. And that's a gift. There's nothing you and I can do for it. But second is the reward. According to works. According to works. According to our works. It's a reward. Some will be given rulership over ten cities. Some over five cities. Some over one. So it's the time of that reward. And three. At the end of verse 18 says, And should destroy those who destroy the earth. And so it's the time when those people are ready to obliterate all life from planet earth, they will be zapped. And you read in Zechariah 14 how it says, At the split of an eye, you'll come and while they stand, their eyes will, will collapse and their tongues and all that. I mean, they will be zapped. They don't even have time to press any atomic bomb or anything like that. They'll be gone vaporized you don't fight with Christ he's got far better ammunitions than we have far better ammunitions than we have so brethren that will be the time that's prophesied in Daniel chapter 2 turn with me to Daniel chapter 2 Daniel chapter 2 Daniel saw all these things, but he didn't understand them. But look in Daniel 2, you've got that big image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, that dream. And in verse 35, in Daniel 2, it says, Then the iron, the clay, and the bronze, and the silver, and the gold were crushed together, and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone, that's Christ. That's the rock. That's the stone that struck the image, that struck this Gentile empire that came all the way from Nebuchadnezzar, all the way down from the Babylon Empire, all the way down to the Roman Empire, and the final resurrection of the Roman Empire with the ten toes of iron mixed with clay. The stone that struck the image became a great mountain, became a great kingdom, the kingdom of God ruling on earth, and filled the whole earth. And look at the interpretation a little further in verse 44. And in the days of those kings, that means of those last few kings before Christ comes, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. The kingdom of God will never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. In other words, the rulers will not be outvoted. Three years later, four years later, they will be there forever. And it will break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. And so much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without irons, and it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold. The great God has made known to the king what it will come to pass after this. The dream is certain. And its interpretation is sure. Brethren, that's the government that you and I fight for. That's who you and I are ambassadors of. That is our great hope. We have a lovely hope, brethren. We have a hope. And after that, the next major event, in other words, part of that destruction will be destruction of the beast and the false prophet and that. After that, the next major event will be putting Satan away. And we'll talk more about that on the Day of Atonement.